So they monetize it. I just mute it. I just don't. Monetize. I mean, I'm not kidding. Within minutes. Wait, how do you so they, you can you can go through on their side and just say you want to get rid of whatever is the copyright violation. Oh. Just like, and it just you know class was over. I just forgot to shut it off between oh. periods. Yeah, and literally it was. I got the email like it must have been no more than five or six minutes. In this period. That's, how do they do that? Hmm? They have a algorithm that checks everything for her. It's awesome. So. We got quizzes? All right. All right. So we have a little bit. So then let me try to get, if we get everything done, I'm, I'd like to have the test soon. Who would like a test soon? Showing off. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's all we have matters. I think you have it done. Huh? On with hand. All right. Oh, okay. What is going on? That's a shark. What is that? It looks like a dog. No, it's a shark. See, a dog, you go like that. Oh, okay. See, that's a dog. <laughs> yeah, shark is this. It's science. The best part is that was all filmed. Okay. <laughs> all right, so let me go back a little old, wrong way. John led you a good story. Are we watching the video today? We're not going to because I. I ran out of time, so we're going to watch it another time. So did we get to this? Yeah. Did we get to this? No. This? Yeah, we're on AD. Oh, okay, so the quiz I wore. Who did the United States go to war with? France. France. Who was president? Uh, Jefferson. It wasn't Jefferson. Who was president? Adams. John Adams. And so Republicans bitterly criticized them. which political party supported France. I know how Republicans. Republicans, yes, the Republican Party. And the Republican vision of the American economy was going to be what? That's a lot of quiz. Got to grade those. Yeah, small yeoman. And what was the Federalist version no, vision of the future? And what did it mean to try to alleviate the difference between the classes? Uh, something. something, something. Very good. It was part of the Republican ideal of the common man, which I'll talk about a little more today. Do they want to lead us? What were they? The Republicans were not elitist, so to speak. They were trying to lessen the difference. Say it again. Egalitarian. Egalitarian, which is lessening the difference between the classes. And what was the big rebellion in 1794 in Western Pennsylvania? Did you do a little drinking? What was unusual about the election of 1796? Yeah. First contested election. Who became president? And who was vice president? <laughs> what? <laughs> Adams became president, Jefferson vice president. Oh, yeah. We're good. So, we got this was about Republic. This was an anti Republican bill. And the alien, do we get the five to 14 years? So, that's to become a citizen. How about dangerous aliens? I love how they wrote it in the book. So, they could deport people they thought were a threat or dangerous aliens. Of course, it's a great way to just get rid of political enemies and say you're dangerous. I'm sorry, dangerous. An alien is who is not a citizen. They could be legal or illegal, but and then Citizen Genet is a classic example. He came from France during when Washington was president and tried to push the United States into a revolution, terrifying a lot of Federalists, fearful of revolution. So basically, they're justified by saying we don't want a bunch of Citizen Genets. And then lastly, they outlawed sedition. And what is sedition? Criticism of the government. They said, you criticize the government while we're fighting France in this, well, 
and what we call now the quasi war, you're you're helping the French win. But he criticized government. Wait a minute, doesn't that seem to violate a certain amendment? Well, the government cannot take away freedom of speech, and that's what they're doing. There can be no republic if you can't criticize the government. You're not, you can't criticize the government. You're talking about one party rule. To so become an election, I solidly get 98% of the vote. People love it. And so this is incredibly dangerous. But Federalists said, hey, we're just trying to win the war, but Republicans knew exactly what they were trying to do. They're trying to silence criticism of the government. They're trying to weaken the Republican Party. Similar laws will be passed during World War I, and you'll see actions like this later on. You're trying to shut people up. I'd say you're hurting the war effort. This is why, or this was why, Washington warned against wars, foreign entanglements. Because foreign entanglements lead to tyranny. You get into wars, you start passing laws to restrict citizens' rights to, with the justification of winning the war. Get rid of any kind of dissent because you want to win the war. Wars are very dangerous. You know no different. We've always been at war your whole life. We'll talk more about that when we get there. Tomorrow. We're just going to skip everything go right to 2009. Sound good? Yes. All right. So, Jefferson and Madison, furious that, oh, before you write this, I forgot to write Adam something. Adam signed the bill. Adam signed all three. Adam didn't like any of those three laws. Adams didn't like it, but he thought they were constitutional, so he thought he had to sign it. The idea of a politician, a president, vetoing a law because he didn't like it politically, that's unheard of in 1898. So Adams signed it, but by signing it, they became his laws, even though he didn't like the laws. And so, Jefferson and Madison, furious, and remember, they're both officers of the federal government, vice president, speaker of the house. They would author two resolutions given by the state assemblies of Kentucky and Virginia. So these aren't laws, but the, they agreed to these resolutions. And what it said was states could nullify unconstitutional laws. If the president won't do it, states will do it. Nullify means do not obey. Basically saying that they're going to say that the Sedition Acts do not apply to Virginia or whatever state. They didn't actually nullify, but they said to. But here is the nullification right here, Kentucky, just a handbill. But this was actually put in 1833. And this shows why this is so dangerous. In 1833, South Carolina would nullify the tariff. It's a bigger issue of slavery. And it nearly led to civil war and destruction of the Union. This is really scary. Two things come out of this. First off, if states don't obey federal law, if big hunks of the country don't obey the law, the union's dissolved. It can't survive. You ever hear what I said? The country can't survive if part of it doesn't obey laws. It's over. Because then, you know, I don't want to obey this law. Why well, don't like this law? Some states on constitution, we want to obey here. And the federal rule breaks apart and then basically it'll break up. So the country cannot survive if there's nullification. But part B fits in the same vein. Let's say a state nullifies a law, and the federal government says, no, you're going to obey. Well, Jefferson and Madison said that the states can do what? Exactly, secede. They secede. This is civil war. Now, it didn't happen, fortunately, in 1800. The country couldn't have survived. If it would have gone to all out civil war in 1833, the country wouldn't have survived. This would be the justification of civil war, ironically using Jefferson, the author of the Declaration of Independence, and Madison, the author of the Constitution, the father of it. They would give the blueprint to civil war. Very, well, dangerous, but also um, negligent on their part. Fortunately for the country, it didn't happen. A peace conference, this actually happened in Europe, but the U.S. was involved in directly, called the Convention of 1800. And at least in the short run, there was peace between Britain and France, so the Quasi War ended. So the Quasi War basically ended. And there, that's the Convention of 1800. Here's leading away French prisoners. But 
And you have had no name, so. But the reason I have this yeah, is because everyone's still talking about the election of 1800 is going to be about the Alien and Sedition Acts. And it's going to confirm everything that the Republicans were saying about the Federalists and arguing what the Federalists were saying about the Republicans. The election of 1800 then is a rematch. Never in history has this, will this happen again, where you have the president running against their vice president, and isn't that a great picture? Hmm. The very flared nostrils, no smelling. And then, remember what I told you, they all look like. But when you see John Randolph, it's hilarious. <laughs> where are you? But, the Federalists, or sorry, the Republicans referred to Adams as like an autocrat or a tyrant. We told you he wanted to bring back the king. We told you we can't have the Federalists. And the Federalists referred to the Republicans and Jefferson as a bunch of revolutionaries. The guillotine is going to be set up right there in, in the District of Columbia. And he's up. They really push that in the north. He's a slave owner. We know what slave owners do. They just kind of, it's going to become a big deal right after the election. Yeah. What did they respond to? He's a, like a revolutionary and a slaveholder. But the slaveholder was a little bit, you know, they didn't want to go all out and say slaveholders because the Constitution allows for slavery. So it was, it was kind of a touchy area. <clears throat> well, the election would be very close. Here's the electoral map. And so some of these states split. And the Federalists were strong here. But the Republicans, what their idea was this, both parties were, were going to do this. They, they wouldn't have a repeat of 1796. The Republicans wanted Aaron Burr to be the vice president. Okay, nobody really trusted Burr, but he's from New York, and he could get New York to let votes. All Republican electors would vote for Jefferson, then all but one would vote for Burr to avoid the tie. And that's what happened with Adams and Charles Pinkney, his running mate. That was the plan. But do you see a problem? When the Republicans went, the Republican electors arrived in the brand new capital of Washington, D.C. Still D.C. Soon to be Washington, D.C. They forgot which one was supposed to vote for Burr. Or not vote for Burr. So better safe than sorry, they all voted for Burr. So even though Jefferson had more votes than Adams, Burr and Jefferson tied. Therefore, nobody has the majority to tie. It goes to the House of Representatives. What a disaster. Now, Burr should have said, I, the electors wanted Jefferson. I'm not supposed to be a president. I'm going to step out. But what did Burr say instead? Yeah, I president. yeah president sounds kind of fun. Let's do it. And who else was really happy? for this disaster happening to the Republicans. Adams. Adams and all the other Federalists. <laughs> yeah, let's get Jefferson. We'll be fur perfect. But then a few Federalists realized, uh, Burr's a scoundrel. <laughs> and this proves it. Now, in the House of Representatives, every state gets one vote for president. So even if there's a state like New York had 10 members of the House, those 10 members would come together and vote, called the caucus. And whoever won that vote would get the one vote for New York. That's how they did it. So this is how the vote turned out. That's supposedly the meeting there. Jefferson did win because some Federalists decided, we can't do this. This is a cynical attack on the Constitution and Burr's a scoundrel. Especially what? Federalists. Very famous Federalists. Did everything he could to make sure that Burr did not become president. And that's what we got to get down. Hamilton. Hamilton and Burr hated each other. And so Burr never forgave Hamilton. Even though it wasn't all Hamilton, it's other people too, including Adams, ironically, kind of realized. But in 1802, Burr tried to become governor of New York, and does anybody want to guess what Federalists campaigned against them then? And they began a letter writing campaign against each other in newspapers. I like newspapers, and it got just the 
the insults and attacks went up and up and up. And we'll get to the duel. I will teach you how to fight a duel. Yes. And you're excited? Yes. Really? Well, and that's why we got Partridge Hall after we can duel. Okay. So, one more thing. Do you remember that term, slave power? What did that refer to? What? Compromise. Yes. Yeah. The three fifths compromise. Let's go back and I'll, I'll come back to this. Well, let's go back to, okay, Adam's at 65. Most of his delegates were from places that did not have slaves. If they only counted white citizens as population for representation, I know that sounds horribly racist, and it is. But remember, we're talking about the northern anger right now. If they would have only counted white citizens and not slaves as three-fifths of a person, the vote would have been 65 for Adams, 62 for James. This would begin the begin. This would be the beginning of the end of the Federalists. They only lasted for a few more elections, and eventually one party, and then would break up again. If Adams would have won, we might have a totally different course of history. If he didn't want, let's say Louisiana, Federalists didn't want that. They thought it was too much, unneeded. Too many Republicans will move in there. Who knows how history would have been different? And that's where you get the term slave power, and they call Jefferson the Negro president. And here's Jefferson, this philosopher, author of the Declaration of Independence, the author of the Virginia Statute of Religious Freedom. So that's why he's a philosopher. And he's, is he a philosopher? No, he's just a slave holder. And this cartoon will be done after the election. And it's supposed to be like Jefferson, who's just basically the rooster on all the hens hurting the slaves. Whenever they would draw slaves or anybody from Africa for reasons I don't know, they'd put them in a turban. It doesn't really make sense, but this is 1801. And that's why they called him the philosophicon, a rooster. The idea was that he was you know, acting like he is this great philosopher. And what is he? Nothing but a slave. Nothing but a herder of slaves. A major insult. But that's not just it. After this election, Northerners started bringing up more and more about slave holding, but something else. Romans laws passed, and they talked about masters and their female slaves. <laughs> Everyone knew it. They talked about it, and they brought it up, especially the fact that after Jefferson's wife died, he was always around his wife's former slave, who just, and she, her wife's former slave just happened to have a number of redheaded children. That's weird. And the other ironic thing is, this woman by the name of Sally Hemming, and this is an anti-Republican poster, Sally Hemming, her father was almost certainly Jefferson's father-in-law. Slavery. And so this is an attack on them, beating a slave, and in that creepy way that guy was kissing, which actually I think is quite appropriate because we know what's really going on there. She doesn't have a choice in this. And so they start bringing up Sally Hemming. Just kind of, you know, Sally Hemming. What is Jefferson doing? What is slavery doing? We really want somebody like that as president. And it started after the election. 1804, this would be an issue. And ironically, everyone knew what's happening. Southerners would be very offended by this. How dare you tell, how dare you tell the world what we're really doing? That's our secret. They'd be really upset about this. And they'd be really mad about the talks of slave power. And Northerners thought it was a conspiracy against the Constitution. You can see the beginning, you know, this running to the Civil War. That's Virginia and Kentucky resolutions, slave power, and others. That is just creepy, the eyes there. I think it's actually pretty good. So what we're coming to is the age of Jefferson. Republicans immediately dealt this a revolution. We're changing the world. In reality, there weren't that many changes. Jefferson basically had kept most of the Federalist policies. At the Bank of the United States, he rather grudgingly thought, okay, this is working. And Adams, though, really thought Jefferson was going to bring the guillotine and destroy the country. Adams was so mad, he'd be the first president and one of only two presidents to not go to the inauguration of his successor. He didn't go. He was basically, I'm going home. 
not going to go to his inauguration. Anybody know the other president to not go to their inauguration? Who? Who? No. Okay. When they resign, then the or president dies, the vice president sworn to so some inauguration. I know. And he didn't go to the swearing in, though. You're right there. But which one did he go? Well, Teddy went to Taft, because that was the show that set your most fun time. Barack Obama went. Don't say Trump. Someone say Trump, but he's still president. There's no successor until you're not in office. <laughs> no, Trump's still president. And if you open this, can you do a shot so you don't go? <laughs> <laughs> I don't say the president who were assassinated. <laughs> John Quincy Adams. Huh. I wonder who his father is. Adams had a little temper issue. He thought Andrew Jackson was going to destroy the country, so he left. Didn't go to his inauguration. Ironically, Jackson would save the country, but we'll get to that later on. But the big thing about Jefferson, it was a revolution in one way. It was a revolution in how Americans felt about themselves. It was a revolution on what it meant to be an American. And so much of our ideal of what an American is would come out of Jefferson's ideas. Good and bad. And the whole idea of more and more of what we think democracy is, where people decide their leaders. Not quite yet, but it's coming with Jefferson. This is a groundbreaking, though, election because we have somebody who but you have a radically different point of view taking office, at least in some ways. And it was a smooth transition of power, even though Adam's power went home. So, let me get to his philosophy. I should add this about the horse. Jefferson would ride his horse to the Capitol or ride around the little, Washington, D.C. was just basically a few roads, a few buildings, and swamp. But he would ride in pretty common clothes, he, back where his pants, breeches, they were called, with rips in it. Because like it's, I don't care, I'm a commoner. And so, the philosophy of Jefferson. This we've got to get, and the big key element is the common man. Now, when I put down common man, I don't mean average. I don't mean just somebody who's not good or bad. No, common means of common birth. Somebody who is not an aristocrat. Someone who's not born in wealth. Jeffersonian's idea was you no, know, is that fulfilling the idea of the pursuit of happiness, regardless of whoever you are. This is the ideal. You can go as far as your abilities take. You don't need to be born in wealth. We don't have titles of nobility, and so it's the idea that anyone could do anything they want in the United States, and that was really Jefferson's idea of common birth. Now, later on, people will attack that idea and say, you just want mediocre people. No, that's not what he meant. Common birth. But, you know, that's why I put this here. Was that really what Jefferson thought? Jefferson was still pretty darn elite as they applaud down the hall. Jefferson's elite. <laughs> oh, I was part of the band, but. That's Jefferson's home, Monticello. It's amazing. It's a national park. You ever get a chance to go there? It's beautiful. How big is that house? By the way, I should add this. He was obsessed with classical architecture, copying the Romans. So it was a dome. And the Library of Congress and the U.S. Capitol, when they rebuilt it, would copy that dome. Then they rebuilt it to a different dome in the Civil War, which we have today. It's a beautiful building. How many stories? <laughs> All right. From a distance, he wanted to look like a relatively humble house. So just a few stories. Yeah. Close. One more. Yeah. You get closer and closer to this. It's huge. And this door is twice the size of a normal door. From a distance, it looks smaller. It looks just like one story, right? Just one story. It's one, two, three, four, five, six. It's huge. Seven. 
And yeah, you get to the door, you're about that tall, the door. You open the door and you just open up this massive foyer where you go up to one floor and put it down a couple steps to another floor. Which this floor goes right through the window. And you can't even see it when you're next to the windows. It's, it's just kind of an optical illusion. But from a distance, it looks humble. You get close, it's not humble. That's the home of an aristocrat. He taught common man. And I like showing that as an example how well, it was a little bit of an illusion. <laughs> if you ever get a chance, go, Monticello is really cool. And it tells you a lot too, because you go behind and guess whose homes you see there? Yeah, these tiny little shacks for the slave quarters. And then you see how he was able to afford this and his inventions and the greatest library in the Americas that would become the basis of the library of Congress. Yeah, yeah that, that's it today. That's that's maybe ten years ago. Yeah. It's it's a national park. It's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the library of Congress. Yeah, library of Congress. He's not doing it. Really. Just, they, have, they have the selections. They, have, they, they always have some uh, exhibits out so you can look at some books. They let you look at some. And if you're researching, you go into the actual library and they let you walk through it. It's unreal. And the other thing is, this big, massive building, I was there, the temperature outside was like 150. You know, it's DC. And uh, inside, there's no air conditioning, and it's cool because of the marble. That was real. That was really a lot of cool because it was cool. Yeah. Get a chance for the Monticello. Field trip. True, from the grant. Huh? From my grant. Fake tales. Throw money from freshmen. I'm just throwing ideas out. Uh, no, I like Wait, it. that's on film now. We would never do that. <laughs> so, next. Jefferson believed. Now, this is where he gets the illusion. Part two of his philosophy. This agrarian lifestyle, a yeoman tilling the soil, working the dirt with their very hands. Yeah, but not him personally. Not him personally, so there's that illusion. But he was fearful of all, he, he didn't hate industry, but he's fearful of wage workers. It, these new factories that Hamilton wanted are owned by one person, the workers will become wage slaves. And the only way would be, this is actually a poster from the Grange in the 1860s, but I like it because it shows like a farmer as the master of their domain, or this kind of idealized Western farm. Independent, nobody tells them what to do. But then again, don't forget, this is a big plantation on over 200 slaves. So we had that philosophy, but he's always thinking about how do I get more land for small farms? And plantations. Next, what does frugal mean? Did anyone just have that in English class? <laughs> First off, Jefferson, he's a plantation owner, they're always in debt. So he's really scared of debt. He's always in debt. But there's something else. He was worried that the federal government borrowed too much money. It'd be hard to pay back, but remember that whole thing about the mercenaries. Do you remember that for the Assumption Bill, when he called Hamilton's idea that he'd sell the bonds to these people? He was scared about all that debt would go to power somebody else. So he believed we got to cut spending so we don't have debt. Well, we don't have a lot of federal government spending back then, so what did we cut? We already have a minuscule army. That's still a fort at that time, not the military academy. And a minuscule navy, cut it even more. Now, that allowed them to spend less money, but... What happens if we go into a little war down the road? Could this be problematic? <coughs> Just imagine that we <laughs> fight a little war with the most powerful empire in the world. Might be an issue. Yeah. <laughs> no, not really. The whole thing. <laughs> but actually, not much bigger. <laughs> Next. He feared a large central government. <laughs> and I'll tell you all about the damn government sometime after that. After the AP town, we're going to have nothing but I'll spend a day, I'll tell you a couple stories, especially when I run into the free man in Jordan. If you don't know what they are, they make national news. Damn government. That's actually Washington, D.C. in 1800, and it was not this nice. 
It literally was a swamp in a few buildings. But does anybody know what laissez-faire means? Now, I, I speak American, so it's laissez-faire. You're on the right track, but it's an idiom. So it's like a, it's like a slang term. <laughs> Um, so basically what it means is hands off by government. So even though you're right, it's an idiot for like, you know, like it means a little bit more. Now, if we're speaking not American, if we're going to speak French, it would be what? Of course, I speak American. Every teacher I ever had was a la laissez-faire. Wow. And I know that everybody who spoke French, they would just, yeah. Hurt them. <laughs> so what's I bear? <laughs> and I go, I do both. I don't even know I'm doing back and forth. But this actually comes from a book, his Jefferson's Ideal, from my favorite Scottish philosopher slash economist Adam Smith. We will get to Smith a little bit later on, so don't worry about it right now. But what Smith said and Jefferson believed that. If you have a large central government that's really interactive in the economy, that will help wealthy, and I, for some reason, I did not type the word merchants. So help wealthy merchants. That's what he feared a large central government was. So government hands off will help boom, Jefferson thought. Really? No, he thought he thought hands off hands on would help merchants. Hands off? Themselves. Merchants, farmers, agrarian. That's what Jefferson believed. So he thought if we have a limited power of the central government, we'll help small farmers. Now, two things about this. First off, Jefferson obviously did not actually read Adam Smith because Adam Smith says the opposite. But secondly, this is still pre capitalism. This is still pre capitalism. And so he's not going to realize what's going to happen when we have some people owning machines called capitalists and how that will totally change the power base. Well, we'll get to that a little bit later on. It's pretty. <laughs> so, gum it. Yeah, I'll tell you about those guys. Jefferson's other philosophy was his idea of what's Everything he thought was going west. Monticello, you go to the back door, go out on their, their deck and walk, and he wanted this way. He could always look at the Appalachian Mountains and think, where the future of the United States is to the West. So Jefferson was obsessed with becoming a continental nation. He was obsessed with buying Louisiana, which you're sitting on right now, that land claim. And for two reasons. This is why I put up a tobacco plantation. What happened to land after a few years of tobacco cultivation? Yeah. And so plantation owners are obsessed with land. Jefferson was a tobacco cultivator. They're obsessed with land. Yeah. It depends what side of the divide. If you're on the eastern side of the divide, it's Louisiana. Western side was Oregon. We're in the east. Because. Very close. And the other one is here. These are actually Creek Indians. But Jefferson, remember, he wants land for small farmers. That's his vision. Well, the U.S. has a lot of land. The Treaty of Paris gave the United States all this land. But what about the people like the Creeks who live right here? They're not ready to be assimilated as American citizens, Jefferson. And that's why Jefferson wanted Louisiana in the first case, the first place, to move the eastern tribes west. In the 1830s, this would be called Indian removal. Hmm? Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that. They never had the it's Louisiana, but a secret treaty with the French, with the Spanish. So that's why he just was obsessed with the West. He would, he thought, if I could just walk somebody through the West to the Pacific Ocean, they'll give the U.S. a claim. Three separate times, he would try to get an expedition to give the United States a claim. Now, the most famous one of the three is the Court of Discovery, but he tried two times earlier. That failed. One was an amazing story. The other one never really got off the ground. And lastly, the most important part of this is 
this philosophy. What I want you to put an asterisk, a star, a circlet, italicized, underlined, put it in bold, superscripted, uh, double space, all caps, but no caps. What else? Uh, wingdings. Make sure pragmatic. Jefferson was intensely pragmatic. Most presidents are pragmatic. What's pragmatic mean? Did we get that in English? Huh? <laughs> A very easy definition would be practical. Regardless of what he said in the past, if there's a problem, he'll come up with his best solution. Okay, maybe not the best solution for everybody, but best solution for him. Regardless of what he said, he would come up with a solution. I give you three examples. So here's signing the Louisiana Purchase. Jefferson always said, before he was president, strict interpretation of the Constitution. The Constitution never said the U.S. could buy land. Yet he had a chance to buy Louisiana. What did he do? But it never says they couldn't. Exactly. And that's implied powers. He's going against what he said in the past. Isn't he? he criticized Adams for an undeclared war, and yet he did an undeclared attack on Barbary pirates in North Africa. So he went opposite of what he said, but he felt he had to do it. Well, then it depends on what. Remember, without that whole necessary and proper and apply powers versus the numerator of powers. And lastly, Jefferson knew slavery was bad would destroy the republic, and was immoral. Yet he didn't want to get rid of it while he's alive. Certainly didn't want to get rid of his nice lifestyle, so he kept it. He pushed, he promoted it, his policies would be pro-slavery, and he never got rid of his slaves. Including his children. They were slaves too. Slavery's horrific, isn't it? So, that's pragmatic. If you're a supporter of Jefferson, you would say he's thoughtful. He's effective. He's showing leadership. If you're an enemy, what is he? Hypocrite and a liar. Which is he? Oh, no. Ah, isn't it great? Yeah, I mean, I, I could argue both ways, can't you? Most of the great presidents in American history have been pragmatic. Very pragmatic. Abraham Lincoln, incredibly pragmatic. Franklin Roosevelt, incredibly pragmatic. Hmm? Yeah, Lincoln. You say Lincoln was so pragmatic, it's hard to even determine. Hmm? Did you say some of them were just out pragmatic? And heard it. Nixon was pragmatic. Uh, and um, easily the most divisive president in America. One of the most divisive presidents in American history. So pragmatic doesn't mean you're making good decisions. They're usually pretty thoughtful. Thoughtful people are more pragmatic. Doesn't mean you're right. Doesn't mean you're honest. Just means you're more thoughtful. Barack Obama was intensely pragmatic. He, 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 I would argue the definition of pragmatic is Barack Obama. Um, Trump, it's too hard to quantify. George W. Bush, not very pragmatic. He was more ideological. Ronald Reagan, very ideological. Jimmy Carter, ideological. Millard Fillmore, eh. And uh, or Miller. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So Franklin Pierce, drunk. All right. So yeah, he had a lot of issues. Number one, oh no, Andrew Johnson, pragmatic or not pragmatic. So that's pragmatism. Anyone here pragmatic? <laughs> Hypocrite. <laughs> if you don't know, it's not very funny. All right, so let's get on to a couple things that happened. Watch it. Even before Jefferson became president, a big event happened, and they're going to be called Midnight Justice. So we're out of the philosophy now. And what happened was this. Does anybody know what you call a president or someone who either isn't reelected or leaving office, but they're still in office? Lame duck. Lame duck. Well, back then, the president wasn't inaugurated until March of the next year. 
So you have nearly five months after the Electoral College decided Adams is still the lame duck president. And what he did was, him and Federalists, which still controlled Congress for one more year, they created a bunch of new federal court shows, which will finish tomorrow for your dining and, I would argue, dancing entertainment. That's a nice thing. I was going to give it to you, but you were tardy. Uh, oh, who's taking the PSAT? I mean, you're going to be here, but all right. Like I told you, we'll do it. I'll, I'll find a standardized test. Don't worry about that day. I know you're like, oh, please, more multiple choice standardized questions. You guys might Yeah. Was there anything else? Just I don't know. Okay. I have to clean my desk. That's what I do seventh period. It's like spanking. It's spikes every month. Hey, I can't draw. I can shut up. I can it. You did? I never draw back like a crispy trap. No, Alex, I'm going to break something if I try and do that. Don't break it. Here. We have Louis the 14th. Ready? I'm ready. Well oh. done. I should be the quarterback. Working with cement today? Come on! Yeah, your Yankees won one game. I know. We won two today. We won one day. What did they play tonight or in the afternoon? I think it's also, I have to go on Thursday. Oh. Did you bring it on Friday too? That's not a few days. Yeah. Uh, well, Thursday we watched a little. You're coming to see how Mila Ayan is good at the things. And Friday we were going to have Mr. Sati, but then there was a hit. I just saw him. So he said he's coming down. Yeah. He's been. I have to have this. But this time, unlike, oh, thank you. Unlike uh, the other day. I am better prepared if he doesn't show. Oh, thank you, Mr. Here. Ah, Mr. Chauncey is here. I'm leaving. I was, yeah, I had to bail on you. Circumstances beyond my control. So it's a personal thing. Yeah. But everything was okay. Yeah. Was that the actual water you used? Anything else? Well. There's 73 that didn't conduct them anymore, but they still called them. And they said, if we need to, you're ready to go. Yeah, let me get that one. The uh, Yeah, because it, it was a good sight. Oh, we're still, we're still recording this. <laughs>